Uh, don't slip out of here uh, easily on a slippery slope. Um, <laughs> uh, Vlad on uh, the political economy of slippery slopes with a, a royal um, a, a royal end with Hayek and Samuelson. Um, that's and, and Buchanan, I take it. So yes, there, Buchanan there we go. Brennan. Buchanan and Brennan. So uh, let's end. Last one. Here goes. Okay. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm glad so many of you are still Move present the mic. here. Oh, Is this Move the mic up. Up. Yeah. How much up? Not underneath, but yeah. Is it better? Okay. Okay, so this paper puts together uh, two arguments about uh, slippery slopes that are kind of mirror images of each other. So one is uh, Hayek's argument in the road to serfdom, which is uh, fairly well known and very uh, widely discussed. And the mirror image of that is Samuelson's argument about capitalist fascism or what he calls capitalist fascism. Uh, and then as part of this kind of debate between Samuelson and Hayek, uh, Samuelson kind of pokes Buchanan. So Buchanan gets uh, brought into this. Uh, Brennan also writes a, a response to Samuelson on capitalist fascism. Uh, and uh, Buchanan basically sees that uh, as a a good opportunity to write the reason of rules with uh, Brennan, right? So you'll see basically the origin of the reason of rules, uh, how it, part of the origin story is in this debate between Hayek and uh, Samuelson. Okay, so in a nutshell, Hayek's argument is that if you have certain uh, progressive policies, that could create a slippery slope towards fascism. Uh, so Samuelson's argument is that uh, if you have certain attempts to impose free markets, that will create a slippery slope towards fascism. Uh, so in Samuelson's account, basically, uh, voters don't want the free market system. Therefore, the only way to get there is by uh, reducing democracy. So that's what's going to create the slippery slope for him. Okay, so that's gonna be part of uh, his uh, theory of capitalist fascism. Uh, an interesting thing that happens here with Samuelson in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, is that he kind of changes his mind on the welfare state, so he became uh, far uh, more moderate, and in a sense, he became very close to Hayek's uh, argument in the road to serfdom. Uh, so, as kind of a result of that, uh, he builds this theory of capitalist fascism. Okay, here's Buchanan hearing about this theory for the first time. <laughs> it was not happy. <laughs> okay, so Samuelson doesn't refer explicitly to Buchanan, but um, he refers to um, a bunch of referenda that happened in California. Uh, which Buchanan supported, and he calls the support for those referenda as capitalist fascism. Buchanan is uh, completely flabbergasted, like how could a referendum be uh, fascist, right, instead of being uh, democratic? Um, so part of what me and Andrew are kind of getting out of this is that everyone in this uh, debate or debates is uh, mischaracterizing someone else's argument. So, uh, but despite the mischaracterizations, you get various interesting ideas out of it, right? So there is kind of a counterfactual here. What would have happened, you know, if Samuelson didn't completely, you know, mischaracterize Hayek? What would have happened if Buchanan and Brennan didn't mischaracterize Samuelson and so on? But, you know, we have what we have. Uh, Okay, so here's the plan. First, what is the actual meaning of the road to serfdom? So how did Samuelson interpret road to serfdom? Uh, there's a, a bunch of counter responses to Samuelson um, that me and Andrew are also not very happy with. So basically, I'm going to give you some evidence about what the actual meaning of the road to serfdom is. What exactly is the 
uh, slippery slope that's in that book. Um, then, as part of uh, explaining the slippery slope better, I'm going to um, explain this um, framework of uh, analyzing interventions on the market that Hayek gets from Mises' early book, Interventionism, but Hayek adds on to that uh, framework. Uh, then I'm going to move on to Samuelson to see how he converges uh, you know, towards a more moderate position. So he starts to insist that the welfare state has to be a limited welfare state uh, because otherwise it becomes inefficient and it also uh, undermines um, uh, political rights and the civil rights. Right? So he gets into an argument that's kind of close to road to serfdom, but he doesn't see it that way because he mischaracterizes the road to serfdom. So out of that, you'll see the theory of capitalist fascism, which will be the, the main difference from Hayek is that they have different opinions about what system is a stable system. So they have kind of a very similar framework of analyzing the slippery slope, but they have a very different opinions about what is stable, what's not stable. Uh, okay, so then there's the Polk to Buchanan and there's the origin of the reason of rules there. So to some extent, the framework in the reason of rules kind of undermines the whole uh, slippery slope, the very idea that there is a slippery slope there. Um, okay, so what's the meaning of road to serve them? So Samuelson interpretation, this is a quote from Samuelson's 1980 uh, edition of economics, which is the first edition that has a section on capitalist fascism. So that's kind of the first uh, place where he puts this. He, you'll see uh, many quotes about this from various interviews he gets, but this is kind of the most uh, uh, high profile version. So in the, in the book, right, in the textbook, he has this account of Hayek's road to serfdom, and Samuelson's interpretation is that Hayek says that each step away from the market system and towards social reforms of the welfare state is inevitably a journey that must end in a totalitarian state with neither efficiency nor liberty. Right? This is uh, Samuelson's uh, underlining there. Okay, so there's this idea of inevitability. Uh, that's part of it. So Samuelson also provides a figure to explain road to serve them better, right? So the idea here of the road to serve them is that you are uh, introducing certain political reforms that reduce economic freedom, and as a result of that, you will inadvertently undermine political freedom. So you will end up in serfdom, right? So he then he doesn't buy this story that there is this slippery slope. So he provides this fact, right? Which is not a fact, it's made up data. But <laughs> here's this fact, right? So part of what's interesting here when you compare him with Hayek is how he characterizes fascism, right? So on one hand, you see Hitler's Germany here has lots of economic freedom in Samuelson opinion. Chile 1980 also has a lot of economic freedom, more economic freedom than the United States in 1980, according to Samuelson. And here you see fascism as high economic freedom, low political freedom. Okay? But Hayek's point in the road to serfdom, by right, Mises' point earlier in the omnipotent government, is that fascism uh, has very low economic freedom. That is basically a version of socialism where instead of just blatantly uh, nationalizing the means of production, you introduce uh, such widespread price controls that basically the government controls the economy, de facto controls everything, right? So in, in Hayek's account, fascism is not here, it's here, right? Hitler's Germany has very low economic freedom. Uh, okay, so as I said, this is just data, it's kind of, Samuelson imagines. He doesn't really have that much data about that. We have some data now. Uh, so this is Frazier economic freedom. This is the varieties of democracy, liberal democracy, 
So according to like modern measures of economic freedom and uh, democracy, right, Chile in the 1980 has actually very low economic freedom, also very low democracy, right, has less, definitely less economic freedom than United States in the 1980s. Uh, it's not shown here, so Chile in 1985, according to this data, will be somewhere around here, and Chile in 1990, here would be 1985, and 1990 will be something here. Right? So the, the Pinochet regime just moves a little bit, Chile, uh, towards more economic freedom, and after democracy, they get a lot more economic freedom rather than less. Okay, so this is a, an important difference between Hayek and Samuelson because they differ about this meaning of the term fascism here. Uh, okay, so there are several possible interpretations of the road to serfdom. So the historical inevitability, which is very common, but uh, is, it's not very reputable to say that this is what uh, the road to serfdom means. So people who are familiar with the book generally know that's not what the book says, that it's inevitable that we're going to get to uh, uh, serfdom, that capitalism is inherently unstable. Uh, this is partly kind of what Samuelson seems to argue, but Samuelson puts in, has a broader interpretation of the road to serfdom than just this thing. But this is important for Samuelson because uh, he thinks the data contradict Hayek's thesis, right? So in fact, Scandinavia did not turn into a fascist dictatorship, therefore Hayek's road to serfdom is wrong, right? But that assumes that there is an inevitability going on there. Another interpretation is the logical inevitability. So it's just that if you have central planning, then you cannot logically have a, de a democracy, right? So say if you nationalize all the means of production, say you nationalize all publishing houses, you cannot have uh, freedom of the press, or, right? So this kind of argument. And also if you have central planning, you put in, uh, in place a hierarchical system that creates positions of power. It's very hard for that hierarchical system to remain uh, democratically uh, accountable. So that's kind of a logical inevitability, not an actual inevitability. So interestingly, Samuelson agrees with this logical thing, but also he doesn't think it's very interesting. He thinks everyone knows this. This is not a, an important contribution that Hayek makes. So the other one is that this, there's a slippery slope. Right? So there could be a slippery slope that's inevitable, or there could be a slippery slope if you do things. So there's a general slippery slope idea where this is what you saw in the quote earlier, that any kind of movement away from free market will take you down this slippery slope. Right? So this is part of uh, Samuelson's interpretation of the road to serve them. There is a different a slippery slope, which is conditional, which says that only some type of interventions get you down the slippery slope, while you could have some other forms of uh, uh, welfare state that do not take you down this uh, slope. Right? So this is the actual Hayek's argument. Okay, so Samuelson basically thinks there's this combination of things. Right? He agrees with this he thinks is not very interesting. He thinks there's also some sort of inevitability uh, argument in uh, uh, Hayek's thesis, and he thinks Hayek's making a general claim. Any kind of movement away from free markets is gonna take you down towards uh, totalitarianism. Okay, so there's kind of a, an attempt to counteract that interpretation, uh, and this some early Caldwell papers like that, but the, the current Caldwell is not like that. Uh, there are some early Betke, I'm not entirely sure what Pete's position is right now, but the, the attempt to defend Hayek, uh, Hayek's road to serve them is to say no, he's just 
It just means the logical inevitability. It's just an argument about central planning, and then he later on makes argument about the welfare state, so say in the Constitution of Liberty. Uh, okay, so this is just not very accurate, right? He, Hayek does care about welfare state. Uh, so he cares about this very early on. He's very, very concerned about this. So here's a quote from a prepared post postscript. Uh, some of parts of this turned into foreword. So here's in the postscript in 1948. He says that I'm convinced that for some time the, uh, the USA will continue to move towards state planning. The basic ideas have already got too much hold, right? So this is the mechanism uh, that he sees. Whether the US will continue on this way into a completely totalitarian system will depend on whether we are willing now to support efforts in the intellectual sphere, so on. Right, so it's not an inevitability argument, right? It's, it depends on whether or not we choose to continue down the road or not. Right, so it's most definitely a conditional, um, right, it's not an inevitable slippery slope, it's conditional on people's choices. Uh, but it is also definitely a concern about the welfare state, right? It's not just an argument about central planning, right? And in the actual foreword in 52, right, uh, he, he's very explicit. And he says, the hodgepodge of ill-assembled and often inconsistent ideals, which under the name of the welfare state has largely replaced socialism as the goal of the reformers, needs very careful sorting out if its results are not to be very similar to those of the full-fledged socialism, right? So this may be a bit subtle here, right? So the point here is that some of these welfare state policies could be as bad as full-fledged socialism or will take you down that slippery slope, but others are not, right? You need to carefully sort them out, right? So, and then he's saying, well, there is some danger that our impatience for quick results may lead us to choose instruments which, though perhaps more efficient in achieving the particular ends, are not compatible with the preservation of a free society. Right? This, is, this part here is also interesting because he acknowledges that some of these policies may actually achieve their purpose. Right? So this will, uh, you'll see in a second, is a big part of Mises' uh, interventionism framework, right? Do the policies achieve their stated goal? Okay, so the, so Hayek's road to serve them does care about a welfare state, okay? But it's not a general slippery slope and it's not an inevitability slippery slope, right? So now what exactly is the kind of policy that he's concerned about, right? So there is some uh, hint about that in the rule of law chapter in Road to Serfdom, and then there's the entire part three of Constitution of Liberty, which is basically, you know, what kind of welfare state is compatible with a free society, right? So in a nutshell, Hayek's argument is uh, that any policy you want which uh, obeys this rule of law idea which means that everyone is subjected to the same rule, that is compatible, right? So do whatever you want as long as whatever policy you put in place, everyone is uh, subjected to that policy rather than subjecting specific groups to a policy, other groups to some other policy. So that's his big criterion. So he's concerned about Welfare state policies which do not satisfy the rule of law criterion. Okay, so what's the uh, mechanism that he has in mind uh, that push us along the slippery slope? So here he borrows from Mises' interventionism. So now Mises, you probably know, is like super radical. But this is an older book. Uh, so this is similar to Mises' socialism book where he basically says, look, I'm gonna take the goals of people advocating X, Y, Z, and I'm gonna try to evaluate whether the means they are proposing are actually um, leading to the goals that they're stating, uh, right? So 
In Mises' intervention, right, so in socialism, he does that with central planning. So in interventionism, he tries to do that with welfare state policies. So his framework is to say, let's ask two questions. First of all, will the intervention achieve its stated goal? Notice this is the stated goal. The policy may have a different goal, right? It may actually achieve whatever goal they're not trying to tell. Right? But do, does it achieve the stated goal? Right? So the second question is, OK, suppose it achieves the uh, stated goal, or maybe not. But regardless, will there be side effects that will require additional policies? Right? And these policies will, be, will have negative effects from the point of view of those proposing the intervention. Right? So his whole thing is like, you, you want this, these are your values. First of all, do the methods you propose lead to what you want? Secondly, do, do, do the methods you propose have side effects that from your own point of view have negative side effects? Okay, so you can think of a table, uh, and what Mises does there is just to pick up policies, right? He says, okay, let's look at this policy. It fits there in the table, in there, there, there. Okay, so he's just looking at various policies. He's not having a general theory of any policy. Right, so in the sense, that book is less interesting today because we have a ton of policies that are, he's not discussing. He's discussing some weird policy we no longer have. Uh, but you can kind of see the idea, right? It's just. Okay, so for instance, he's super concerned about price controls, right? So price controls not only don't achieve their uh, goal, but they also have these larger side effects, right? Because uh, they then uh, they spur additional price controls or additional regulations, right? On the other hand, say he looks at subsidies uh, or taxes, and it's like, okay, I don't support this, but I guess. It, <laughs> It's not that bad, it does achieve the goals, doesn't seem to have that many side effects. Right, so it's more, uh, it's, it's less of an ideological book. Anyway, so Hayek takes this uh, framework, right, in particular this question is important, and he adds uh, a political element to this, right? So Mises is only concerned with economic policies. You have a price control here, say on the price of milk, then all of a sudden now all the milk producers switch to making cheese. You now have to regulate cheese, right? So it's like purely economic policies he's focused on. So now Hayek asks, okay, but what about the changes in political institutions, right? So say you, pr you put price controls in place, that creates all sorts of chaos Right? So now people are living in chaos, so now they're going to support a populist dictator that you know, says they're, they're going to bring order. Right? So there's going to have a negative political side effect. Okay, so this is, uh, this is not entirely inaccurate, what Samuelson points here. Right? So it's the economic policies, but then there's an impact on political institutions. That's kind of the interesting thing. Okay, you can see a more accurate version of Hayek's uh, road to serve them, right, which is not inevitable. It's like we have this question all over again, right? So you can either mend your ways, right? So you can take the bait, don't make, mend the ways. So you end up here, but now again, you, you cannot mend your ways. So eventually you end up in serfdom. But then every moment, you have the chance to switch gear, right? So it's not inevitable. That's why he writes the book, because he's trying to convince people, hey, you know, have a brain. Let's move down this other line. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, we run out of the alphabet. OK, another, <laughs> another way to think of this is to think in terms of kind of basins of attraction, right? So for Hayek, there are two systems that are stable, right? There's kind of the classical liberal, right? Maybe you have some welfare state there. Uh, and then there's the socialist dictatorship, right? So he thinks 
okay, if you are introducing these uh, interventions on the market, then you're gonna make it harder and harder to uh, evaluate things, right? So the knowledge problem in actually specifying a correct policy becomes more and more difficult, right? Because partly because he has this uh, account of how various policies make the system more complicated and more, uh, more difficult to predict and more uh, discretionary, right? So the knowledge problem becomes more difficult. So you may think, okay, we're just gonna move along this line, but at some point you're gonna end up in the outer basin of attraction, so then the incentive problem will increase the, uh, enormously, right? So you're creating these institutions uh, to say manage the welfare state, but as a result of that, you're creating positions of power. So at one point, those positions of power come associated with an incentive problem there. So you can end up in the other basin of attraction, right? So that's the concern. You have well-meaning people who advocate a move in this direction, right? They're saying, okay, there may be some inefficiency with the welfare state, but it's worth it. And he's saying, well, how about maybe you move too far and you end up in the other basin of attraction? Okay, so let's see what happens to, High, uh, to Samuelson uh, around the late 70s, early 80s. So there's some convergence to Hayek's point of view. Uh, so Samuelson's main concern is with inequality. So he says that, well, it's not the function of the market to worry about inequality. That's the function of the democratic government. Right? So he has this separation. The function of the market is to be productive, to produce things, but then is the function of the democratic government to assure that the distribution that emerges you know, is not too unequal. But then he adds, well, history shows how difficult it is for a welfare state to not overreach itself in the attempt to correct gross inequalities. Right? So that becomes a problem. So yes, you, the democratic state should uh, address this inequality problem, but what's the stopping uh, criterion there? What's stopping the democratic politics from overreaching in this attempt? Okay. So he has this idea of the limited welfare state. He starts saying over and over to everyone who wants to listen to him, hey, we have to have a limited welfare state. Right, so he says, so the, what spurs this change is an observation of Scandinavia, right? So this is his interpretation of what happens there. So he says, the evolution of the middle way has, has forced me to believe in the limited welfare state. That's his emphasis. Uh, wherever the GDP outside of the market begins to equal or exceed half of the total, somehow it becomes less feasible. Its efficiency does suffer, and actually its responsiveness to true needs and desires of people, surely the ultimate test of an ethical system, does begin to deteriorate. Right? So he actually gives you a criterion, what he thinks is too much, right? 50% of GDP. So you know, somehow you go beyond that, things start to uh, you know, turn nasty. He says this over and over again. So he's an, uh, he talks about the Swedish government, uh, right? So he says, a good mixed economy can apparently be a limited welfare state, but disregarding the, object, uh, the objective limited seems empirically to be at the peril of inefficiency and stagnation, right? And earlier he says here, it's also you know, lacks responsive to human needs. He's another one. Right, he, he emphasizes not just inefficiency, uh, but also infringing on important human freedoms. Right? So he becomes very uh, similar to Hayek here. It's not just that the system becomes uh, more economically inefficient. You're starting to get some nasty political phenomena going on here. Right? So do not go above 50%, basically. Right? So how does he think you know, what's the criteria that stops this, right? He says it's very easy to go beyond that, right? So he doesn't really have 
an institutional solution. He says, keep your warm heart under the check of your cool brain. Okay? You have only so much altruism to operate with, economize on it and cut extra marginal activities of low efficiency and secondary ethical worth. Right, so basically, if you're just, you don't have any welfare state, you're just cold-hearted, don't be cold-hearted, but you want to be warm-hearted, but still keep a cool brain, don't go too far in there, right? It's inefficient. He also has this, uh, this accounts of how it undermines culture. He says that in Sweden, people no longer pay taxes, they um, uh, no longer trust each other, and so on. So he thinks, you know, this has widespread negative consequences if you go too far, how do you stop yourself from going too far? Just keep a cool brain, okay? It's, in, it's not entirely clear who should keep a cool brain. I'm assuming the more the better, but this could be like economists should keep a cool brain. You know, if voters can keep a cool brain as well, but you know, if you're an economist and you don't keep a cool brain, that's really bad. So, okay, so there's some convergence here, partial. Okay, they come from very different directions, right? Ideologically from classical liberalism or social democracy and methodologically from very different, right? So Hayek's argument is primarily a theoretical argument. Samuelson gets convinced by the empirics, right? So they end up in the same idea, let's have a limited welfare state. Now, it's only a partial convergence for Hayek what limited here means is that it's an institutional criterion. He wants to say, only, have only the, lim the welfare state that obeys rule of law idea. For Samuelson, it's just a quantitative, right? Just don't go above 50% of GDP. Right? Okay, so Samuelson has this other thing, the capitalist fascism. Right, so you have these people like Hayek who get concerned about the welfare state, so what are they gonna do? Right, so suppose the voters don't accept your case for free market. Right, so suppose you're a classical liberal, what do you do? Right, so one thing would be, okay, you just accept democracy, so you're gonna just say, okay, let's have an inefficient welfare state. Uh, but the other thing could be, you're gonna support imposing certain rules to just create a free market despite the fact that voters don't want this. Right? So that is what uh, Samuelson calls capitalist fascism. Right? So it's a, a form of fascism in the sense that it's undemocratic, it explicitly builds up rules to constrain voters and what voters want, but why do you do this? You do this in order to create the, the free market, right? So it's, it's capitalist because the institutions are the institutions of markets, but it's fascism because it's not desired by voters. Okay, there is another possibility here is that say if you're a classical liberal, you could say try to persuade voters, right? So that's kind of another type of arrow that's not drawn here. Uh, Okay, so you can think of Samuelson's theory of uh, capitalist fascism as having several steps in it. First of all, he takes very seriously the, the idea that he attributes to Schumpeter, right, fairly correctly, uh, that he says, well, the economic system is economically stable, but politically unstable, like a, a, a laissez-faire system, right? Would work in principle economically, but not politically because voters don't want that, right? Voters will vote uh, against the free market laissez-faire system. They would vote for various types of welfare policies. So it's not politically stable, okay? But then if it's not politically stable, there's, what do you do about it, right? So he says, well, one possibility is the fascist solution, right? Get rid of democracy and impose upon society the market regime. Okay, and then he goes on saying, you know, never, this is attributes this to the free market supporter. Never mind that trade unions must be emasculated and pesky intellectuals put into jail or exile. 
right? So we get here because these people support this imposition of fascism. Okay, but that's not the end. He says, well, this system is not stable, right? This capitalist uh, fascism system is not stable because fascism everywhere, right? So you see the empiricism again. Like, there's never been a record of a fascist system uh, s staying in power very long, right? So history records no known case where fascism succeeds, even on its own economic terms, for a sustained pe uh, period. Uh, and then he gives this interesting argument that if you're familiar with Timur Kuran's private uh, truth, public, tru uh, public lies, right? it's the same argument, interestingly. He says the dictators dare not ease on repression. They never know how much dissent is being bottled up. Right? So if you're a dictator, you cannot leave, uh, let people talk their minds, but then you don't know how upset they are. So that means you cannot know just how much violence you need to put in uh, to, keep your, to keep you in power, right? So you're bound to make some error at one point, so then it's not stable, right? So say with Pinochet example, he thought he's gonna win that election and he organized an election, you know, he ended up in prison. <laughs> he lost the election. So, okay, so to Samuelson, What's stable, the stable system are on one hand social democracy, and he accepts that it has certain inefficiencies because of these knowledge problems. But then, you know, what would be in Hayek's system, the classical liberal system, he calls it capitalist fascism, and he thinks that's definitely not stable, right? So you cannot get here without imposing rules that the voters don't want, but if you do that, you're gonna have a dictatorship that's not gonna be stable, so you're gonna end up in a full-blown dictatorship. Uh, right, so he doesn't think this is a, a viable uh, move even on their own uh, grounds. Okay, so you can kinda see the mirror version of Hayek's Road to serve them and Samuelson capitalist fascism. They basically disagree about two things. Which systems are stable, right? For Hayek, it was this and this that was stable. For Samuelson, it is the other diagonal. Then they disagree about the nature of fascism, right? Samuelson thinks fascism is, has high economic freedom. Hayek thinks fascism is basically the same as a socialist dictatorship. Okay, so Samuelson puts forth this theory of capitalist fascism, and then he, you know, this is the poke to Buchanan, he says that the referenda in California that were referenda to uh, prevent taxes, right, property taxes above a certain limit, right, those are examples of capitalist uh, fascism, right, because the rules that are designed to keep a free market in place, okay? Now, Buchanan supported that, and he was outraged, how could that be fascism considering it's adopted via a referendum, right? So it's, a, it's democracy in action right there. Um, okay, so this gets us to Buchanan and Brennan. So both of them react to Samuelson, Brennan reacts uh, more sub, uh, far more substantively, uh, and Buchanan may have found out about this from Brennan. Uh, Buchanan has a paper that he presents in Chile in 1981, which includes uh, both an attack on Hayek's idea of unlimited democracy and an attack on this capitalist fascism thing. Right, so Buchanan thinks that idea from Hayek of unlimited democracy, on one hand is nonsense because no one actually wants unlimited democracy, and on the other hand is dangerous because it is a, basically a propaganda tool for restricting democracy, because you're just gonna claim you know, the welfare state we have, it's an unlimited democracy and so on. So he's, he's attacking in that uh, MPS paper both of, both of these things. So from what we can piece together, 
They're kind of free origins of the reason of rules. So on one hand, Buchanan goes to the MPS meeting in Chile in 81. So there, to his uh, surprise, he sees people who basically bite the bullet on uh, Samuelson's theory, right? They're like, yeah, w capitalism, fascism, sounds very good. So some of those people are uh, members of Chilean government, the like Pinochet government, who are part of the organizing of the conference, and others are European members of the MPS. And their argument is about federal Germany, uh, which in their mind, you know, look, it has a growth miracle, but it was not a, a democracy, it was under the authority of the Americans. So their argument is that was in fact a non-democratic system that achieved that growth miracle. So the same kind of thing that happened to West Germany should be more broadly adopted. Right? So Buchanan see this, sees this kind of people at MPS. He has kind of a bit of a shock. Uh, Milton Friedman is the same. So both, both of them have this kind of impromptu reactions uh, against those uh, supporters of dictatorship. So part of that is that Buchanan gets convinced that you need to have a new case for democracy, right? It's like these people who are supposedly liberal, look, they are actual supporters of dictatorship, right? So why did that happen, right? You have to have a new case for democracy. On the other hand, you have this uh, accusation of capitalist fascism. Right? And they're genuinely puzzled. How is it possible for a referendum to be fascist? Uh, right? So they have an interpretation of Samuelson here that gets them to kind of, they think, okay, Samuelson makes this accusation because he doesn't understand the difference between laws and constitutions. So we need to make this case for democracy. You know, Samuelson has to understand it as well. Uh, okay, and then there's the third thing uh, that there are these skeptical uh, objections to the idea that you could do institutional design, uh, right? So basically, this is this is how the reason of rule starts is with uh, an uh, you know an attack basically on Hayek's social evolution theory, right? So he thinks they they think that's a, that's a big challenge because if uh, institutions are so complicated you cannot predict anything, then you're left with just social evolution, right? So they don't like that. So here's some, this is from Brennan's reaction to Samuelson, right? So this is kind of how Brennan interprets Samuelson. Why, how could Samuelson possibly come up with uh, such a crazy idea? So he says, well, the current preoccupation in economics with examining choices within any well-defined set of rules has obliterated the older concern with choosing the rules themselves. The passing of that older intellectual tradition is to be lamented, right? We must recapture our constitutional sensibilities. So that's kind of what they think is going on. Samuelson doesn't get it that it's, there's a difference between choosing within rules and just making arbitrary decisions, choosing a policy you know, or an outcome that you like. Right? So that would be dictatorial to just choose an outcome, impose it on everyone. But having a democratic procedure that ends up with a certain outcome, that's not fascist. Right? So they think that's what is going on here. This is not a correct interpretation, we think. Right? Samuelson is actually more subtle than this. But that's their, how they're trying to make sense of what's going on. So here's another letter. For, this is a letter from Buchanan to Vincent Ostrom. Uh, so he says, right, this is what our two basic articles of faith are. Right? So Buchanan and Ostrom. He says, well, on one hand, we believe institutions matter. On the other hand, we believe institutions can be constructed. Right, so he says, we, we face opposition on the fact that institutions matter from George Stigler and the modern Chicago crowd. Uh, right, so the, what's going on there is the idea that institutions are this uh, equilibrium phenomenon. Right, so you don't really need to think about institutions independently. It's just something that happens. Uh, right, you only need to think 
of, say, for example, you have a theory of regulatory capture. That's the interests that create the policies. It's not like institutions uh, separately. Okay, and then it says we face opposition from the evolutionists on the second article of faith, right? The fact that you can rationally construct institutions. Okay, so Buchanan interprets Samuelson's attack very similarly to Brennan, right? He says, on one hand, the central thrust of Samuelson's claim seems to be that anything which interferes or sets limits upon the working of majoritarian electoral system uh, is undemocratic and hence fascist. Um, oh, this is still Brennan. He said, but this is surely obfuscation. Okay? There are many ways to uh, prevail uh, exercises, uh, limits on the exercise of collective power. Uh, right? And he says, this is very important error here. Because if you're making this error and you only think of these policies, uh, then you cannot effectively distinguish between alternative social orders, between genuine fascism and limited government, uh, then that is surely cause of, for great alarm. Right? So they think we need to have a, 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 a renewed understanding of alternative uh, institutional systems, okay? how rules come about. Right? You cannot just think of policies uh, and you know, th this kind of thing that uh, Samuelson is doing, they think this is very superficial, uh, so we have to have a, a, a better theory to oppose that. So Buchanan likes that uh, a paper that Brennan uh, writes in, responding to, Sam, uh, to Samuelson, and he uh, proposes this thing on the left, which is the draft Buchanan proposes for a new book he has the title, The Reason of Rules, and he says, okay, the, the second chapter here is gonna be your attack on Samuelson, right? The, those things that uh, Brennan has written, and then his Chile piece, right? The, fact, the, the one that has the attack on unlimited democracy, right? the idea that's nonsense, and Buchanan's uh, response to um, Samuelson. Now, what's in, what ends up here ends up kind of a positive version of that, right? Instead of uh, being defensive, they're just putting forth, this is our vision, right? The contractarian vision, right? So in that chapter, there's no more, uh, nothing about Samuelson, but that's what's going on in the background there, right? So they go out from, we have to respond to this, and then to the final chapter where it's like, here's our vision, rather than just responding. Uh, the first chapter, as I mentioned, you know, has that, uh, you know, basically they put forth a defense of the institutions can be constructed, right? They reject the social uh, evolution point of view. Uh, and then it, I think the only places in the book where they reference the accusation of fascism is actually in the in here where they yeah I think it, where they defend the rational choice model right so they get some accusation of fascism because they use rational choice model so they just double down on that no we're going to use the rational choice model uh, and part of the reason there is that they want to it's not so much that they think that people genuinely are rational, like in a perfect rationality, but they think if you want to justify a, an institutional system, it has to be rationally justified. And secondly, you have to have a robust system. So a robust system has to uh, not be easily um, kind of speculated by uh, um, kind of smart, uh, self-interested people, right? So it's not that everyone is selfish and uh, uh, super rational, but some among us, you know, are psychopaths. So we need to have institutions that cannot be taken over by those people. So it has, they have to be robust. So then the correct mode of analysis is not the average person, but that kind of rational worst case scenario. Uh, 
Okay, so the contractarian vision that they put forth. Okay, this is pretty interesting. I don't think it's all that well understood. Right, so they say here that our position, this is from the reason of rules, our position is explicitly and avowedly contractarian. The contractarian construction itself is used retrospectively in a metaphorically legitimizing rather than historical sense. So on one hand, this is a defense against a common objection to contractualism that is just, that never happened, right? The, when the US Constitution was adopted, it wasn't like everyone came together, there was un unanimous consent, right? So it sounds like it's historically crazy to assume a social contract, right? So they're saying, no, that's not what we're doing. We're not trying to make sense of the actual historical example. We're doing a retrospective legitimizing account. I'll, I'll say that in a second how it works, right? So they want to say, okay, we have these institutions that we arrived at, you know, through a very messy historical process. Which of these institutions that we have can be retrospectively legitimized, right? So to, to see that, you have to have this kind of ra uh, con uh, social contract perspective to think, suppose that we would have had this social contract, which of the institutions that we have, we would have agreed to have, right? If, if the institutions we have cannot be justified from a social contract perspective, you know they're unjust, right? Now maybe you could like rationalize a lot of, uh, you know, bullshit institutions that we have, that's possibility. But if you cannot rationalize something, then definitely you know that's out. Okay, and then they say, Prospectively, the model is used in both a metaphorically evaluative and an empirically corroborative sense. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> okay, so let me tell you what it means. So here's my uh, making sense of this. So imagine we have the status quo. We have some institutions here. This is the set of all imaginable institutions. So we're here. Right? In the status quo, apart from the institutions, we also have you know, people who have their own values, they have their own endowments, right? There's a whole messy historical process that gave them those endowments. So now, we want to put these people behind the veil, right? So we're going to say, you no longer know what endowments you have, but you get to keep your preferences. So we put them behind this veil, Right, so now we're gonna have this argument, okay, let's have these people argue behind the veil, and uh, in Buchanan's uh, construction, right, that goes back to the calculus of consent, you're allowed to negotiate in any way you want behind the veil, except violently, right? So say with roles, you only are only allowed to talk. With Buchanan, you know, you're allowed to bribe the other person to agree with you. Right, so it's like anything except, you know, killing that other person. Uh, okay, so you're behind the veil, but now behind the veil you get multiple equilibria. Again, that's different from Rawls, where Rawls thinks there's this one system we should have because it, it, that's what we get behind the veil. That's not the story here. So we have multiple equilibria behind the veil, so you're gonna pick the one that's closest to the status quo institutions. Right, so now you pick this, right, rather than some crazy radical institutional change. These are basically equally valid, so you're gonna pick this. Uh, so once you do that, on one hand you can see, okay, what's the overlap between I1 and I0? Right, if there, there's an overlap, that's the institutions that you retrospectively, metaphorically legitimized, right? If there's no, uh, the, the institutions where there isn't an overlap, that's where the reform is, right? You should change those institutions because they cannot be rationalized behind the veil, right? They are unjust. Okay, what, what about this, right? So you're evaluating the institutions, right? You don't want to just stay in the status quo, right? You want to have a way to say this would be more just than this. Right, so you're evaluating these institutions, but then you're also 
there's empirically corroborative sense. What you bring in, right, is people with their preferences as they are and the institutions that we have in the status quo. Right? So there's, it's anchored in the status quo empirically, both at the level of preferences and at the level of the institutions. Uh, okay, so this is not a one-time deal. Right? You do this once, then you know, complicated things that happen in the real world, you're gonna be, end up with a different status quo. You do this ever, again and again. There's no end to this. So this is kind of a way to evaluate institutions at any moment in time, uh, right? So you get around Hayek's objection that things are way too complicated, right? Because now you're gonna be focused on a relatively narrow set of institutions rather than on the entire institutional order, right? That was Hayek's concern. So, and you are able to make a rational argument about the reform, right? Which is what they want to do, right? So, and this is a, a constitutional level type of analysis. You're thinking of the system, the rules as a whole, right? So it's not just, I like this policy, let's have this policy, if not, you're fascist. Um, Okay, so as I said, they underestimate Samuelson. So what, the way in which they underestimate Samuelson is that from Samuelson's point of view, this, is a, this constitutional economics thing is a futile exercise because it just brings a constitutional level the regular policy debates, right? It's like, okay, in, so, and Samuelson thinks that's worse uh, because it's gonna make the system more unstable, right? You no longer have this constitutional uh, framework, right? So you just bring everyday uh, policy debates at the constitutional level, you're, go we're, you're gonna be completely uh, unanchored in any institutional thing, right? So <coughs> it's not that Samuelson doesn't get the difference between constitutions and uh, uh, laws is that he thinks this is just a, not a way, a good way to go about, right? You don't want to bring this kind of policies at the constitutional level. You do want to, so one way to think of it is you have the, the originalist interpretation of the constitution, what the founders wanted, then you have the living constitution idea that you have the rules of the constitution, but we reinterpret them all the time. So de facto, we kind of change them, although on paper remain the same. And then you have Buchanan, who's even worse than the living constitution from Samuelson's point of view. Because it's like, now you're even going to change the rules, not just the interpretation. So that's even worse than the living constitution, if you think, right? So, in Samuelson's account, he thinks, well, Buchanan wants us to get closer to an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, but the way he's, uh, pro what he's proposing is actually making things worse than the living Constitution, because he's making even the formal rules unstable. Okay, so that's the end. <laughs> <laughs>